All right, everybody, welcome back to the Sarah Centralis show. Got a great show for you today. And I know this for a fact because we've already had an incredible conversation. And uh, just before we hit record, we've been just chatting it up. Welcome to the show, Anthony Trucks, first of all. Um, then I'm going to give you a, a little background on what we're going to kind of talk about and get into today. So for those of you who don't know Anthony, and I think a ton of my followers do, um, follow him, follow his Instagram if you're not already. Um, he's an incredible emotional, motivational uh, speaker and a former NFL athlete and American Ninja Warrior contestant. And I mean, there's so much that you've done. Um, Anthony, and there's so much that you're doing right now and that you're passionate about that I want to dive into today, especially your um, kind of coaching philosophy about how someone finds their shift. Uh, but before we do that, what I love doing on this show, because uh, my story is a big part of everything that I do, and I, I find that people really resonate with how you got to where you're at. Like, what has the journey been? And I know you've like me, have overcome a lot of adversity, been through a lot in your life. Can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got to the place where now you're sharing what you know and helping people have shifts? Welcome to the show, Anthony. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, the uh, let's give them the rundown so they know why they should yeah. listen. To I've always found that to be the thing. It's like, like ah, it sounds cool. But like, why, why should we listen to this guy? Yeah, I need the backstory, man. I'm all about the backstory. backstory. Like, tell me, yeah. tell me, like, where that the inspiration and idea and just what the journey, because the journey is part of what you teach. Right. And, and oh, without it. it yeah. 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 We've all got our own journeys too, which is, which is a good thing. Like I'll share my journey, but my journey is just a journey, right? It's not the person who's listening's journey. Their journey is the most important one for us spending here time. Honestly, I think that, uh, but my, my story lends to why I have some kind of value to share. Right. So I was given away as a kid and I didn't have much of a sense of uh, peace or home or like belonging. Right. So anybody that's had that feeling of like, I don't matter or the people that I want to love me don't, that was my set point. Uh, I bounced around from house to house had a lot of weird, crazy things happen, torture and abuse, just odd things. And then at six years old, I landed into a house, which is my current home, uh, which would put me as the only black kid in a very white, all poor family. Just, we had nothing like it just, but we had love, you know, I didn't look yeah. like anybody, but it was, I was one of them. You know, it's like the, uh, it's like when the, the like Baloo, was it not, was a, the, What's the one with the kid, the, the jungle, the jungle the child or some jungle story with okay. uh, Mowgli? It's like the, the kid with all the different people, you know, it's like, hey, I don't look like you, but hey, let's fit in. And so we had this whole journey of just, you know, sensing out and feeling out where I belong. So that was kind of the part of it. So if anybody's felt like, I don't know if I belong, I don't know if it's my place, like that's kind of what it felt like. And I journeyed through this life of not thinking I mattered very much, not thinking yeah, I had much. Yeah, abandoned, I can't imagine the abandonment stuff. Like, yeah, there's a lot there. It, just, it riddles you, it just riddles like all over the place. And so what it did is it put me in a place where I was able to kind of finally, finally have to push forward because we all have these moments where to push. And so my push was like, if I'm going to be great, I got to find a way to be great. And so I leaned in and started doing things that weren't comfortable, but they led me to a place of feeling comfortable and eventually being great. And part of it was sports. Football gave me a really sense, a good sense of self of who I was and where I mattered. And I was able to lean into that. I sucked at first, got real good, got a college scholarship, played at Oregon. We have a kindred yeah. connection there. Yeah. Uh, after Oregon, which were, as in Oregon, I had my son, met my biological father, a lot of crazy cool things. And then I got a chance to play in the NFL. And the NFL was this kind of interesting space where like it felt like they, like, like foster care because at any given moment, you have a job or yeah, home. Yeah, you'd be gone. No, job, no home. And so I ended up uh, getting out of the NFL after an injury in my third year. Tore my shoulder, came home, lost my sense of self. Who's Anthony without football? And it led me to the path of having to build myself again. Because at this point, I was married and then divorced. Three kids, high school sweetheart. Nothing was going good. One point, like suicidal. Just life sucked. And I built myself out of this hole because I just woke up one day and go, I don't, I don't like where the train's headed. I want to, I want to end up in a different destination. And through that process, I was able to unpack some things I'd already done in my life and bring them back to the forefront take massive action on some very specific things so I could wake up and feel like the guy who deserved the life that I aspired to. And that's something I had to earn. And I earned it. And over time, found that people liked the story. It was beneficial to them. And so it became something I started sharing uh, reluctantly at first. And then over time, sharing more of it. And the more I did, the better I got at telling it, the more yeah. impact I could have with it. And so it became a career and I've loved doing it. I, I love that on so many levels and there's so many things I want to get into, but that last point that you made, I think resonates with a lot of people because we all do have a story. We have, um, you know, 
some of ours are, are tragic. You and I both have a pretty adverse background that we came from and some aren't, but uh, I think there's so many people out there who are afraid to kind of share their story. And it, I, I always liken it to being that dream of being naked in front of the world. It, yeah, there's a reason to be scary. It's a little vulnerable, but yes. leading into it completely changed my life and sounds like it really led to your next chapter as well. Do you have mm -hmm. any uh, tips for people who know or, or are already feeling compelled, like that their story could impact somebody's life, but they don't know what to do with it? Yeah. I mean, the thing is everybody's story can, it's just a matter of who, right? Because everybody is in a place that is past a place they didn't want to be previously. Right. And there are people who are currently where you once were. So everybody's got a story. It's just the the level at which you want to deliver or share or use the story to help people. And if somebody got an inkling going like, God, I'm thinking about it, I want to do it. Th there's something you have to do before you step into it. One, you have to cross some finish lines, meaning you have to have accomplished something that these people aspire to and that gets you in a position to have anything of value to share with them. Just because you want to share your story doesn't mean you should, right? If you're still on a journey of trying to navigate your heart, your, your sense of self, your pride, your confidence, I don't think it's healthy for either party for you to lead people in that position. So first part is you have to figure that. The, the second part of it is you have to figure out how to make it uh, no longer your story. And people go, what does that mean? Well, it's not actually my story. It's my experience. Mm -hmm. It's the world's story. And as long as it's my story and I share it in that way, I think like it's mine, I don't think I'm willing to give the parts of it away that they need to hear to actually get the impact because it's it's for me. It's how am I going to feel about this when it goes out? How am I going to? And you alluded to earlier, there's a vulnerability and a true like sharing has to come out of it. And most people have phenomenal stories, but they don't make phenomenal impact because they don't share everything because it's about them. So what I realized was my story was not my story, it was the world's story, my gift to give them, but it was just my experience. And when it became about the people and somebody else hearing me, it turned into this thing where like, I was willing to give everything because the purpose was for someone else to be impacted, to get a lesson, to get an idea from it. So when I had things like my marriage fell apart because my wife had an affair, um, I didn't feel like a like a phenomenal football player when I was in the NFL. I got, at certain points, I didn't feel like I belonged there. You know, and These little things are things most people wouldn't share, but I realized if I'm really trying to help you, you got to know those things because those are the true parts of those who are having great success. It's not always every day, just rainbows and cherry, right? <laughs> it, there's a lot that goes into it. And so I think those who have a story is like have those first foundational pieces in place because then also you will get to the point of, of taking it incredibly serious at figuring out how to deliver it properly to serve people. Because just because I got a story and I'm willing to tell you everything doesn't mean you're going to listen to it because maybe I can't tell it. Like I got kids that I love but they can't tell stories. I swear it takes like 30 seconds for me to get to the point of like understanding, like, are you, are you speaking English yet? Like, are, is it a story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so true. yeah, eventually got to figure out how to refine the ability to talk in a way that people will absorb the message as well. Yeah. And I think that that comes over time too, when it comes with, with practice and getting out there, right? Like definitely if I look back at the first couple of times I told my story, I honestly couldn't get through it without crying even though I, I wasn't like emotionally connected to it or didn't think I was but as soon as I would get in front of a room and start sharing it, it you know this whole kind of different experience would happen uh and now like you it doesn't even feel like my story there's the there is kind of like no emotional connection I understand it as a tool I understand it as how it's gotten me where I'm at but yeah. you're right like looking at it from the lens of like well what did I do to get here that's always kind of the lens I'm looking through like picking picking everything I do apart to be like okay how do I share what I did and mm -hmm. and what the before was what the after is or how you get to the after yeah. and you're all about that you're all about the shifts right like how yeah. do we move from one area to another and you had a dramatic shift when you went from playing football probably the big chunk of your life at that point uh to no longer having that be an option that's a total identity identity Dude. pressure right but uh everyone listening has had probably at some point you've had identity changes i mean you go from, a, from not being a parent to being a parent yeah. all of these things um so what are some of those those tips on helping someone move into maybe the next phase of their life or or finding their identity yeah well there's We'll call that the destination, right? And and the thing is, we all arrive at the destination in one of two ways, meaning there's a shift, right? I, I leave sports, or I leave the military, or I do have a kid, or I lose a kid, right? There's good and bad, and there's always, and it's just, it's when one day you wake up, 
and you're no longer able to do the thing you used to do before. And you start to question like, what's my value then? Because I, I have a skill set that can't be used. Am I worth anything, right? That question comes in. But I also noticed is there's, again, two ways. It happens either on demand, you choose to lean into something to get better or when crap hits the fan. Now, unfortunately, for like 90% of the population, it's when crap hits the fan. All yeah, of a sudden, the world, <laughs> right, the world changed the same. I mean, I lost my career and we don't prepare for it. All of a sudden, we're thrust into this environment going, how do I handle this? I can't do my thing. And then what we typically do, unfortunately, is some people will shift and they'll, they'll lean in and they'll find the things out of just sheer survival. And then some people will just they'll live in the same cycle of life for the next 50 years before they pass away. And it's unfortunate because it could have been amazing, could have done amazing, right? But they usually don't. Now, the other one is on demand. Now, the on-demand portion is one where you actually choose to lean in and go, I see something different for myself from what I'm heading towards. I realize it's going to be hard, but I'm going to still lean in because I want more. And and I believe when I say I want more and them leaning in is tied to them also becoming more. My work's an identity. When I say identity shifts, it's like, how do you see yourself? When you look in the mirror, what do you look at? What do you see? How would somebody else describe you, right? And there's shifts in that. Not, not as much changes, but there's shifts in it. But they happen through these specific things you do now. If you look at, uh, let's say, an identity shift at the top of a hill, and I'm at the bottom of the hill, and I got to get up that hill. We all need some kind of vehicle to get up there, right? You can walk. It'll take a while, but there's usually a vehicle, and the vehicle that we work with is called dark work. Now, I call it dark work because essentially we all have, in order to get to that level, have done something that was in the dark, meaning it was unseen, unsexy, it was uncelebrated, it was ridiculed by people that are close to us, it was misunderstood, but we did it. And in doing it, we developed this kind of weird skill set that most would never get because we just stayed in the pocket when it got hard. We were in that flow. And we developed this sense of confidence, this pride, this brazenness to go deploy that skill when it needed to be done. Like I had this dog in me of like, no, I've already put the reps in. I'm going to go get what I, what's mine, right? Whether it's the podcast or I want to go speak or I want to fix my marriage, whatever these things were. And all of us have done this again on demand. Oh, crap, it's the fan. No matter what is an experience that you go through, because that experience is really what wires you neurologically, psychologically, to have different habits and patterns and actions that allow you to become more so you can then have more. So this shift we're talking about is a shift of habits, patterns, and actions, which is part of who you are at a neurological, psychological level. And that all happens through experience. Things have to happen. There has to be an experience. You can do it accidentally or intentionally. And so my work is in how do you intentionally do it? Yeah. How do you look at the future of what you want and go, you know, I want that. And then ask the real question is, well, who do I have to be to have that? And then when you know what that looks like, you're going to nat naturally go, that's not me. I go, cool. That's good. You have a, a clarity of what's not you. Now let's backtrack it and figure out what you must do consistently to get to the point where that's now what you do. So it's who you are. So you can have that thing you want. Yeah, I love that. So what is the first thing? What do you, is there a, a generalized first thing that most people can do? Is there, yeah, if they're the, in that kind of cut, dead space. Uh, depends on how deep you want to go. I do this, just so you guys know, I do this for like Amazon's, PayPal's, T-Mobile's, Lockheed Martin, like a lot of cool companies I've worked with and gone through these, these things. And so there's a process. If there wasn't a yeah. process, I'd just be a guy with a whole bunch of cool statements and be like, oh, it was no good for me. But I want to actually be a good process. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. I'll execute and get a, get a result. That's what there you I'm go. Gonna... And most people, look at, so the thing is we're going to go a little bit out of the right brain in this. We're going to go to some of the left brain. It's tied to the right brain, but it's going to be process, right? So we've talked about my story, what the experiences are. That's like feeling kind of stuff, which is nothing wrong with that. But process gets to the point where we need to go away from the feelings and create discipline towards a plan. The plan should have a process, which we're going to unpack right now. The first step of what I call a dark work experience. And the whole thing, just you know, it's about working in the dark so you can win in the light in defining moments with what's called a dark work mentality of I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. Mm, okay, I love that. It's yeah, gotta be, It's got to be guttural. Yeah. I need you to have that that locked into your soul. So when you walk out of your door in the morning, like no matter what, I'm ready to go. You yeah. know, I got, yeah. I've done too much work in the dark to lose this job, this opportunity, this sale, this marriage. Yeah. I got this. I'm going to do this, right? But you have to have done this work we're going to talk to. Ready. First part of it is you have to respect the light. That shine we're talking about, respect means to have admiration for. I got to respect it. Like, actually, I have a, a, an admiration for what that vision is. It's like a lot of people go and they go, hey, I want to run a race, right? This metaphor, I want to run a race. And you get running the race with somebody you're going and like you're a mile in and go, hey, how long is this race? Oh, it's a, it's a marathon. It's 26.2. You got 25.2 miles. Whoa, whoa, what? 
yeah. 25. I don't know if I signed <laughs> up for that. Right. And I go, well, a lot of people start things in life, not having an idea of what they're into. It's when they fall all of a sudden start, they go, well, oh, it's going to be too hard. Let me get out of this. So I say, no, let's, let's first, before we even start the race, sit down and go, Hey, we're about to start a marathon, 26.2 miles, about a mile in, you're going to be dead tired. But that's how races are. They suck in the, in, the, in the beginning. It's fun. They suck once you get in the midway point. But once you cross that finish line, you're now a marathoner. You're a different sense of who you are. But I need to respect the vision. So if you want to build a business, let's sit down and clarify what that's going to look like. You want to start a podcast? Let's see what that's going to look like. Respect that with admiration for what it's going to take. Breathe it in and go, okay. I, all you do is eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? Let's just, just step by step. But I see what it is. I can feel the weight of it. I'm going to be okay. I've prepared my mind and my heart for what's coming. Crazy thing is, it's always going to be harder than what you imagine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and it's going to throw you so many curveballs that you never saw, never planned for. Yeah. But but you have to learn. The more you lean into them, the more you get a great outcome. And also people go, well, but I don't know if I can do the vision. I don't know if I can handle that. You can't right now. You can't handle it. Like, what are you talking about? That's not very optimistic and helpful. Like, well, I, what, what makes you think you get to have that as who you are? You don't. But here's a cool thing. When you get there, you'll become that person. Right. So don't stress about that. Whatever's whatever's coming down the line, when you get there, you will be the person to have gotten there. And that's what so all that work is doing. All that work is is totally transforming you into yeah. that person. I think a lot of people, I love there's two things about that. One, you have to have that vision and you, you're not gonna be shocked because you know this, you coach as well. But like so many people start things with absolutely no vision. They've never thought yeah. about best case scenario. They've never thought about what it's going to look like. None of that stuff. So yeah. you're just making it so much harder for every single step of your journey without that. First of all, like you have yeah. to have it and you have to respect it. And then for me, it's always the thing that helps me get through all of those adversities that come your way or the things that get thrown at you that you weren't expecting yeah. because you start to want that, right? You yeah. start to, that respect turns into desire, turns into motivation, turns into all yeah. of those, you know, good things that without it, of course you'd quit. Most people would, because yeah. they're like, well, I don't know why I'm doing this in the first place. Too hard. Yeah. And it's, it's gotta be something you're attached to. And, and also has to be somewhat thing, that thing you believe can take place for you. Cause also part of that is once you have the respect of the, of the actual call it, the vision, the other part of respect and the light portion is you have to actually respect a person who's already got what it is you want. Even yeah. if you don't like them. You may not like the person because there's people I don't like, but I can respect. Like, you know, there's just a lot of humans you like and you go, I don't like that, but I respect their hustle. I respect right. them to do things. Just don't like, I wouldn't want to have beer with them, but I can look at them. Right. And the problem is a lot of people want something somebody has, they don't respect them. And so they diminish what they did to get there. And then they have no clear idea of how they can get there. So they go, I'll never have that. I go, no, no, you, you can have that. You just have to see what it takes to get there. You may not want to see it. But that's what it is. It's right in front of you. And so you can do that part of it. Good. And the third part of respect and the light is stepping in and going, all right, what do I have to do? And people go, oh, well, I guess I do what they do. No, you don't. You do when you don't. Here's why. Some of that stuff, 100% for you. But some of those things are unique to their identity. Exactly. Which means they, they start in a different place with different skill sets, different hindrances, like different gaps in skill. And you have certain things as well. And if you try to just borrow that, you'll do what everybody feels, which is, the, the, I think this is how majority of humans feel. I've been working so hard, but I can't seem to make any traction. Right. You're running on a treadmill as opposed to hitting the ground. And what hitting the ground looks like is, all right, I want to get there. I see what they did, but they already had this skill set or they already had this connection. They already had this thing. So I can't use that. They lacked here, but you know what? I have strengths here. I have to develop this, this, and this different from them. So I can't do exactly what they did. I got to do what I got to do. And now what happens, you start actually plugging your holes. And when you plug your holes, you can fill the bucket up. And now all of a sudden, I'm able to do what I have to do and you can move forward. But you have to know what that work is. And a lot of people enter a journey with no vision, no, 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 uh, we'll call it no person in a position that's given them hope or aspiration, and no idea what they should actually be doing, either from a strategic standpoint or from a personal standpoint, so they spin their wheels for decades and never get anywhere and go, why did I have that great success? Because you were looking at the wrong things. That's the yeah. first step. Or they were trying to copy and paste, like you said, what everyone else is doing. And yeah. I see that a lot, especially in the, the culture that we're in right now, where everyone's just consuming, consuming on all the different platforms. And, you know, you see the people that, yeah, I really like what they're doing. I wish I was like that, or I want to be like that. 
but then aren't ever looking at themselves and doing that inventory of themselves. Like, what is it unique that I bring to the table? Like, yeah, there's a process to get success in pretty much anything you want to do that yeah. other people have laid for you. And so grab what works, incorporate it. But what doesn't work, even if every single person tells you that it should, if it isn't working for you to have that kind of confidence to say, okay, well, what, what do I need to either shift or drop or leave? Um, or maybe it is a skill set that I'm completely overlooking. I think a lot of people have a really hard time finding what it is that they are good at or the value that they bring. That's um, awesome, yeah. yeah. Is there anything that, that you teach that kind of helps people see that or helps bring yeah. their skill set to the, to the light? Yeah, there's, uh, a statement by, I guess a guy named Tim, I think it's Tim Murphy. It's either Tim or Tom. I never, I never figured it out. Somebody told me once and I forgot it. Anyways, his statement is it's hard to see the label when you're inside of the jar. <laughs> and I'm not, this is not my thing. I just, I really yes. like it. And the, the truth of it is, like you're saying, there's a lot of things we can't see about ourselves. In fact, there's a lot of psychological things that force us to only see our faults. Or not force us, but we seem to lean into our negative thoughts and negative ideas. So we, we aren't always, you know, aware fully, like, of how amazing we are. So what happens is we beat ourselves up. And so sometimes you need an outside person to give you a perspective on yourself. You never had to give yourself a little bit of optimism and hope to go forward. Because hope is an incredible tool. It's not a good strategy, but it's a good fuel, right? Ah. So the idea is if I can be hopeful and I can find something because somebody gave me an idea of like what my strength might be, then it could be better. And here's usually what it looks like. Send a text to your friends and fam and go, hey, what is one trait that you would extract out of my life and plug into your life to improve it? That's a great one, yeah. Ask, yeah, I was just gonna totally. say, ask the people who know you the best. Ask yeah. them to describe you because a lot of times and women, I'll take this one on, are, are worse at it, I think, um, finding what their their shine points are initially mm -hmm. when in the very yeah. beginning, right? They're they're really used to overlooking them. Uh, so if you are really struggling, you're like, I don't know what I'm good at. I don't know any, you know, I can't find those things. Ask the people around you, how would you describe me? You know, what do I bring to our friendship that's unique? And a lot of times your thing can totally be hidden in something that you just do as part of your character or yeah. as part of your personality. But whoa, guess what? There's a million other people who don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And that could be, you know, a strength that you have that you could Everything. teach. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and if you don't want to teach it, if you should have uh, something better in your life, I, mean, I don't know, care if we, we want to gain some strength or, you know, run faster or, you know, be, better at walking your dog. I don't care what it is. This is always going to be something where you're going to have some thing where go, okay, I know what I want. Somebody's doing it. What yeah. do I got to do to get there? And that could be applied that simply and should be applied that simply to everything. But then you do go to step two. Step two is the part that so many people never get to. It's a lot of folks in this world that know what they're supposed to do and just don't do it. For being yeah. honest, like they know what they're supposed to do, yeah. never gets done. And this is where the dark work comes into play. Because the dark work is a concept that is, it's not just tied to like doing things with lights off. Like it's, it's doing things without the purpose of public praise, just for you. And, and that is the space where everybody who is amazing has, has gone and, and flourished and then emerged later on out of it, becoming the person we admire. It's not always in front of the camera. You don't always see the work that what happens in front of the camera and the light is because of what happens in the dark, right? And so most people don't realize like you don't get to have the award show without doing like making the movie, you know, and the movie was made yeah. in, the, in the dark room, right? Go make the movie, right? Go do the work. And you don't do it with the purpose of saying, oh, I had an eight hour day. Hey, look, world, I did a good eight hour day. Like it, it's kind of an interesting dynamic because the world we live in now is so based on show the entire world, everything you're doing. And people don't realize that actually at a psychological level, you are diminishing your ability to be successful by trying to show your path of success. It's mm -hmm. so weird, but here's yeah. how it works neurologically. You have what's called mirror neurons in your brain. And so whenever like I stub my toe, you can go, oof, you can, you can mirror how it might feel. Now, if I put you in a room by yourself, no people, no camera, no nothing, you will in fact be productive and efficient. Great, right? I put somebody in the room. I don't introduce you to them. I don't talk to them. You don't talk to them, but they're just there. Your brain starts going, Am I clicking my pen too much? Am I stopping my feet? What are they wearing? Why are they wearing that? What's on this table here? What, like, did they hear that too? I'm now not actually fully focused. I'm not in my flow state. And so what happens is people are trying to like film it all. I'm going to film myself in flow state. 
But as much as you think there's nobody there, that camera knows it's somebody going to be there later. So yeah. you don't focus. You start thinking about, am I positioned the right way? And every little thing like that, it's like having light escape this thing. And so now you can't always just kind of light this thing up. And so you don't get to be focused. You're not dialed in. You don't actually get the work done. You don't get the result. You're never going to be a phenomenal dog trainer to the level you can unless you turn that damn camera off and just train your dog. That's it. Just be exactly. there, right? Yeah. And then later on, you emerge and go, hey, look, in the last you know 20 years, I've learned how to be able to do this thing. And here's some things I've learned. And now put the camera on, right? There's nothing wrong with that. Put the camera on now or do it after, recount it. But you can't do anything for the purpose of that, but the purpose of people. And it sounds so weird, but it has to be that way. And it's not weird because that's how you get ridiculously refined at something. And here's the other part of it. When you later on actually emerge as the third step, you have this different air of yourself a confidence, a killer instinct. You got that mentality. I call it a dominator's yeah. identity. I've done too much work in the dark. And so that's got to be built inside that dark work window. Now there's two steps. There's really three, but the middle ones are necessary for this kind of setting. But the first one is you must design that. Design your dark. Mm. A lot of folks, they don't design what their dark work looks like. They just base it off of hope. I hope I can you know get some things done. I hope, I or even this, I have the motivation to do this. Ah, oh, cool. Go, 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 do, do it. Be What's motivated. Your What's comes. your plan? What's your motivation? <laughs> I'm, I'm dialed in, right? And then Tuesday comes, ah, I like this. Wednesday comes, I don't want to get out of bed today. Yeah. Okay. And they don't. Then all of a sudden the discipline to get it done is gone. Why? Because the emotion's gone because they were disciplined to the emotion. So yeah. when you start deciding your dark, you create a plan. The yep. plan doesn't plan care how everything. you feel. Yep. It doesn't care how you feel. It's got to get done. There's things literally today on my my docket, I did not want to do, but they had to get done because it was on my docket. It's got to get it done. Buckle up, Aunt. Hit the timer. Let's go to work. And in that, I get things done. And here's the cool part. That's my dark work. You didn't see it. No one saw it. Only I did. But I feel good. I feel dialed in. I feel skill. I'm ready to rock. And, and I can come to the light, talk about it later, right? But you've got to actually design what that looks like. Because if you don't, you can't be disciplined to an emotion. You got to be disciplined to a plan. And then the second part of this, which we've already kind of talked to is, Damn it, go dark. Shut off. Go away. You don't have to do it where you like disappear for 30 days. Just maybe it's 30 minutes every day. Maybe it's an hour every day. Maybe it's an hour every other day. I don't know what it is. Whatever you choose it to be when you are completely away from the world and you're locked the hell in doing the thing you don't want to do but need to do, that's where you start developing that sense of identity to shift later on. And then later on, you can emerge from this little pocket of time and go show the world what you've done. I love that. How do you how do you keep yourself from locking up in that space? Because I think that's a fear of a, a lot of people, especially if you are an overthinker or you're the perfectionist or whatever. Yeah. If if all your initial work is done um, where only you are accountable, let's say, or you're you don't have to be learning and all of that stuff. Oh. Isn't there a danger of getting in your head about it to the point where you never come out to the light? No. Well, yes. First off, yes and no. Yes, if you're by yourself, 100% tough. You don't have to be, though. No one said you have to stay in the dark room by yourself. Just means you shouldn't be showing the world everything, right? There are there should be someone in your pocket as an accountability person, someone that you have a conversation with. You can actually, in that dark, be working with mentors. You can have a whole team you're working with. Yeah. It's just before it goes to the world to like, hey, everybody, like, there should be something right. done. Yes, 100%. You're going to get in your head. You're going to do something because here's why. I don't care how much work you do. I don't care how many times you practice singing the national anthem. At some point, you're going to get out there in the middle of the stadium. It's Super Bowl Sunday. You're going to have to do the thing. I don't exactly. care who you are. There's nerves. And you're never right? going to feel totally ready no matter how much work you put in. Right. But and you have to go do it. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's why the third part of Emerge is to compete with conviction, I call it which means compete, go into the, the pocket of, of battle you've been preparing for. Don't just sit back and go, I feel good. It's like, if you're going to be a boxer, don't go in the boxing ring just to go and like get, get in shape. You go to box, knowing someday yeah. you're going to be in front of those lights and step in the ring and call your name in the blue corner, right? Whatever. So the idea is like, you got to be prepared to compete for what you want with conviction, but you have the conviction because of what you've done in the dark, right? Layer then, it. Moment, yeah. Then you, then I, the last part's called D-O-Y-D, draw on your darkness. In the moments when everything seems bleak and everything's crumbling and you don't know if you could do it, some people, they, they tuck away and they falter. And it's because they don't have darkness, dark work to draw on. 
But those who did, the, the Tom Brady's, the Kobe Bryant's, the Michael Jordan's, the Serena Williams, right? These individuals, man, when it comes down to it, even think of like, shoot, what was his name? Michael Phelps, that one race he won by a millisecond, right? right yeah. And then, it, it wasn't something where he's talking to himself going, you got this. It was part of his instinctual soul. I am not going to lose this. He, draw, he drew on the dark moments that he know he did that nobody else did. Yeah. He knows that he for five years was every single day in a pool every day for five years straight. He knew that. His soul knew that. So he's not water. He's not talking to himself. You can't lose this race. He just is not going to lose the race. It's just not, yeah. it's not even in my, it's not even the cards, right? But he's drawing on the dark places. He's not in this, I can do it. It's not that. It's this hunker down. It's the, if you were to look at like his eyes, you like think of like Tom Brady, Super Bowl times down in the fourth quarter. He's on the sideline, like, come on, clap. And he's just like, you can see him. He's like, he's seething. He's, he's somewhere else. He's not with us. Like he is, but he's not here. He's in the place that is the dark place that's giving him the energy to go out in that field and go, I don't care what happens. This game is done. I'm winning it. I don't care if I'm down by 14. This is my, I'm going to win this. And when you've gone to that place because you've prepared in that place, you're unstoppable. Yeah, that's what I love so much about sports because most of us, whether you have ever played it or not, you've watched it and you understand kind of what that process is that your body can take over based on the training you've done based on the practice you've done, based on every meeting you've been to, that you can go out there and not, you're not even like consciously thinking a lot of times you can go into this. It happens to me when I speak all the time, I will literally walk on stage and I'll walk off and I won't even know what happened. It's almost like this little blackout that occurs. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. But when I used to overthink it and used to really try and be like, okay, am I saying the right thing? Am I hitting that right? I mean, those are the worst speeches I ever gave by far. But when I would be able to walk out and let go of all that and just trust the training, mm -hmm. trust the instinct, trust the fact that I've done the work and I'm going to know what I'm talking about. I don't have to pre-think it. I don't have to pre-guess it. But you're right. It is that confidence that comes in and it affects your whole body. I mean, it's the thing that I used to get nervous. You used to be able to hear it in my voice all of that, like it would have, it would affect my physical body in all these ways. It's what, you know, people can have panic attacks and whatever, but now when I've kind of learned how to trust that work that I've done, I can go out there and have an amazing time and get off and watch the videos and be like, okay, cool. I did hit the points. I was good, <laughs> but, yeah. but let it go in the moment and, and trust that process. And I love yeah. that what you teach is like, anybody can do that. You don't have to be a speaker. You don't have to be an athlete. Are there uh, any yeah. other, are there any other kind of big, you know, nuggets that you want to leave us with as we wrap up that for the, you know, that listener who's out there and, and has watched your journey has watched my journey and others and wants to do something impactful in their life. Mm -hmm. um, any last words of advice for them? Yeah. Stop. Um, it's going to sound weird. Stop learning a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> no, I love that. I'm always like, if I'm going to coach you, I want your undivided attention for the entire time I'm coaching you. I don't yeah. want you to go like download 95 podcasts and get 75 other ways to do Part of it. Like, yeah, that's a okay. big piece of it. It's not so much that, so the, the learning thing for me, it's, it's not that I want you to not learn anything, but two things, the biggest lessons you're going to have are going to be in the path to where you want to go. The ones you read in a book, and even if you did get all the lessons, they wouldn't lock in the way they're supposed to. It's like if I tell you, if I told you every single minute thing about how to swing a baseball bat to hit a home run, you're never really going to get it until you start swinging the damn bat. Exactly. So stop stop reading books on on swinging the bat until you swing the bat, right? Another part of it is you got to go do things. Like it, it, you have information. Literally, all of us have information that has not been acted upon. And we think for some reason that there's progress in the learning of everything new we haven't done is... There's no progress in it. There's progress in the actions. So when I say stop learning a whole bunch of stuff, I say go and take what you've already learned and apply that and then find out what you actually should learn. Because sometimes you find out the things you've been thinking you should learn are irrelevant to you, but you don't know that because you haven't acted on what you already know. Yeah. And you, I mean, there's just no growth without it, right? There, it just, everything is going in, just becomes noise at a certain point until you're starting to implement yeah that you've learned. I love this so much. Uh, thank you for pouring into us. Thank you for sharing all of your, your wisdom. I'm going to put those um, highlights in the show notes. Where can people go support you, support your journey, learn more about you? 
Yeah, just go to uh, Anthony Trucks on Instagram. Just at Anthony Trucks. Super simple to find me. Same way we found each other, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, the best, it's the best, fastest way to find me. It really is. I love it. Thank you so much. Uh, and everybody, until next time, get out there and hustle and thrive.